Asino durang brajati shayano yati sarvataha Kastang madamadang devang madanyo gyatu marhati While sitting, it travels far away. While sleeping, it goes everywhere. Who but I can know that deity who is both joyful and joyless? Shankaracharya's Tika The self, while asinaha, sitting, remaining stationary, motionless, duram vrajanti, goes far. Shayanaha, while sleeping, yati, goes, sarvataha, everywhere. Similarly, that deity, the self, is madamada, possessed of mada and devoid of mada, joyful and joyless, possessed of contradictory qualities. Hence, it is difficult to know it, kaha, who, madanyaha, apart from me, jnatum arhati, can know, tam madamadam devam, that joyful and joyless deity. Since the self, as conditioned by various limiting adjuncts, is possessed of opposite qualities and appears variously like a prism, Vishvarupa, or a philosopher's stone, Chintamani. Therefore, it is only by a wise man of fine intellect, like us, that this self can be known. Hence, the difficulty of its realization is being pointed out in the sentence, Kahatang madanyaha gnatam arhati. Who apart from me can know it? Sleep is the cessation of the activities of the senses. The delimitation of consciousness caused by the senses ceases for a sleeping man. When the self is in such a state of sleep, its consciousness being of a general character, it yati sarvataha seems to go to be present everywhere. When it is in a state of particularized consciousness, it, though really stationary by its own nature, duram vajanti, seems to travel far in accordance with the movement of the mind, etc., because it is conditioned by those senses, mind, etc. In reality, it continues here, in this body, only. The text further shows how from the knowledge of the self comes the elimination of grief as well. Ashari rang shari vastitam Mahantang vibhumatmanang matva dhiro nashochati Having meditated on the self as bodiless in the midst of bodies, as permanent in the midst of the impermanent, and as great and pervasive, the wise man does not grieve. And the tika. The self in its own nature is like space. Having meditated on that self as ashariram, unembodied, as that bodiless self, Shu, in the midst of bodies, of gods, manes, human beings, etc., as avastitam, permanent, that is, unchanging, anavaveshtu, in those that have no fixity, amidst the impermanent, and having meditated on the mahantam, great self, and, lest the greatness be taken relatively, the text says, vibhum, the pervasive, atmanam, self. The word self, atman, primarily means the indwelling self. Matva, having meditated as I am this, on this self that is of this kind, dhira, the wise man, nashochati, does not grieve.
for grief cannot reasonably belong to a man of this kind who has known the self. Namaste. So these verses give views of the self from different angles, as if it's something different from oneself, <laughs> a thing outside oneself which can be perceived, but it can't. <laughs> it can't be perceived, but it can be thought about in different ways. It can be conceived, understood, comprehended. And this is what it means when the Upanishad says that the self resides in the intelligence or in the heart, which is the same thing. And it is perceived by perfect understanding, perfect intelligence, perfect knowledge. And we see or read echoes of this uh, understanding everywhere in the Vedas. Huh? The self is situated in the heart and perceived by perfect intelligence. That, I think, uh, comes from Srimad Bhagavatam. I have to look it up. <laughs> but this verse also mentions that it travels, it goes away, it comes back, huh? And what is that? Self as mind. We all know that mind is very slippery, <laughs> very unstable. It jumps all over the place like a monkey. But the mind is a mirror of the self. When the mind is made constant and steady, quiet and serene by meditation, it can reflect the self. And this is what we are seeing when we see light in meditation, when the mind is purified. Similarly, who but I, who but a person of great intelligence and spiritual merit can know that self, which is both joyful and joyless. Sometimes it seems joyful. Sometimes it seems without any emotion at all. How is that? Well, the self has contradictory qualities depending on how we look at it, depending on the type of covering, upadi, that we project on it. Because everything that we see, everything that is perceived separately from our self, is simply a covering, an upadi, on the self. Actually, only the self exists because only the self is changeless and eternal. Huh? And the other things that seem to exist are borrowing their reality, borrowing the property of existence from the self because the self is the only real existence. So try to understand. The first thing that we cognize in any situation, in any place, in any moment, is I am. I am that self situated in the heart, which is perceived by perfect intelligence. And the Upanishad is giving us that intelligence. It's giving us that view because it's being taught by death, who has realized it. He is the best teacher, because he's beyond life and death. He's one of the immortals. See, he earned his place in the higher heaven by means of austerities and meditation. So he knows the path. It's not like he was always like that. He was like us. He was conditioned. But then he surmounted that conditioning and realized Brahman. So now he's teaching the very same path to Nachiketa and through Nachiketa to us. So the next verse, 
the self as bodiless in the midst of bodies, as permanent in the midst of the impermanent, and as great and pervasive. Huh? He who meditates like that, who sees that the self is the root from which everything is derived. The self is the rock uh, on which everything is built. The self is pure awareness, that is, consciousness without an object. And it only appears to have an object when it is covered by, you guessed it, upadis. So because the self, like the ro <laughs> good old rope and the snake, <laughs> is seen in different ways according to different angles of vision, once one sees that actually, ultimately, every angle of vision ultimately leads to the self, then no longer he has suffered uh, to experience grief. No longer does he suffer from fear, anxiety, or ignorance. He knows that knowledge, knowing which there is nothing further to be known. That's a verse from Bhagavad Gita. So once we know this knowledge, once we know the self, how would I describe it? It's like in dawn, you know, now it's early in the morning, the sun has just come up, is that beautiful golden light, you know, the golden hour. And it's like the sun rises within the heart. It's the only way I can describe it. For so many years and decades and lifetimes, we wander in this world and the heart is dark. When we go to meditate within, we, there, there's nothing there. It's just dark. It's empty. Huh? And we have to struggle to do sadhana, to make offerings, to earn punya, to bring ourselves to the stage of love of God, and ultimately to ananya bhakti, that love and worship of the self, the non-dual self, as the ultimate and then we have a chance to actually meditate. And when we meditate for real, then this light begins to show forth, just like the light in the sky just before the sunrise. And it does have that beautiful uh, pinkish, golden tinge, you know, it's such a wonderful, pleasing, calming, and feels like love to me, you know, uh, a love supreme. <laughs> I've really got that song stuck in my mind <laughs> for the last week now. And in fact, I'm working on a tribute song um, to honor it because Coltrane's achievement was so great. I mean, it's only becoming uh, more and more clear as time goes by just how great his achievement is. So it's unfortunate that in his time and in his lifetime, uh, people didn't really get it. Well, a few did, a few. His wife did, and her guru, Satchitananda Swami, he got it, you know. Um, and of course, the musicians, <laughs> the musicians around Coltrane all got it. And I mean, hanging out with those guys put me on the path to where I am today. So this is the power of these Upanishads. This is the power of meditation, even a little meditation, in which the mind becomes silent. There's no more verbal thinking, no more inner conversation. Now, this is called the second jhana in the Buddha's teaching, that there is no more verbal thinking. There is only awareness of what is without adding anything. See, without covering it by some upadi, 
without creating some artificial designation and giving it a name and categorizing it as a form, but simply pure experience. That's the first stage of real meditation. And you know, it's like Jesus said, uh, one has to become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. A child is not thinking. A child is simply wide open experience, isn't it? Whatever happens around them, they are fully aware of it without having to categorize it or name it or put it in some box, you know? <laughs> That's a habit we learn from school, mainly, and from other people around us. This is good, this is bad. I want this, I don't want that. Huh? And so on and so forth. Uh, it's a tendency that's built into the mind to accept and reject. But the meditative mind is beyond that because it realizes that everything is simply a manifestation of the self and therefore is neither good nor bad. It simply is because that's the nature of the self. I am that I am. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.